It is Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was yet another non-virtual Get Your Ass Kicked at Jiu-Jitsu Wednesday, although there was no Jiu-Jitsu to be had. Uh, just because I am uh, I'm still kind of sick, still got a minor little itch here and there, and uh, I want to make sure it's 100% resolved before I go uh, running back out there on the mat and spreading my my goodness all over the mat. And I'm, I'm sure there are some of you out there who, uh, who wish you had teammates as considerate as I am, and you know what? So do I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like I, I can understand you want to get after it and whatever, but if you're noticing glitches in your health, you gotta, yeah, especially skin health. You know, I mean, if you're in any kind of grappling sports or anything like that, you gotta be staying on top of it. You know, shit like athlete's foot and whatnot, that's bad enough, but it can get worse. And when it does get worse, you need to resolve that shit. And you need to not take it back to the fucking gym with you. <sighs> anyway, that's the extent I'm going to bitch about that one. Oh, man. Interesting stuff going on, though. I did manage to get some sort of workout. I've been trying to uh, to change my regimen around. Because I, I noticed that I, I've been getting kind of lazy, you know? And a little, little bit spoiled. Not necessarily entitled. You know, I still open doors for people and shit like that, but, you know, just a little bit, a uh, little bit on the spoiled brat side. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know, spending, spending as much time as I do on my own, I've only ever had to really account for myself and a few others as far as, you know, uh, who, who I've had to tend to, you know, on a personal level. Now, don't get me wrong, that's included a lot of shit that... Well, let's just say they pay people to do stuff like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, like uh, you know, tending a loved one while they're they're uh, slowly passing away from cancer or something to that effect. That's you know, that's that's stuff that you hire other people to do. But I've done anyway. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to like draw that immediately to a downer. Jeez. But yeah, so I um I've been trying to change it up a little bit. You know, get out of this this lazy ass groove that I've been going into. And uh, first thing in the morning, I got on the old rowing machine, put in my mouthpiece, put on my headphones, and ground out about you know 10, 15 minutes. Not not like persistent, consistent, really, really hard, but I mean consistent enough that I would consider it a, a singular exercise block. You know, I wasn't like taking 30, 30 minute blocks or, or, you know, I wasn't like getting up from it and walking around and doing other stuff. You know, it's like a couple of times I got a little excited and I had to uh, tone it down just a notch or two and uh, catch my breath again and then get back on it. But yeah, I've been, uh, I've been trying to push my cardio capacity because that's like the first thing to go. Uh, any time away from the mat is your your cardiovascular capacity. The next, of course, is midsection tone, and, and that one I've been addressing on my mat. I haven't been on it in the last day or two, um, but I'm I'm definitely planning on getting on it today. You know, just to uh, get back in that groove, get on that thing. But I I envision that uh, with any kind of luck. I'll be going back next week. You know, it's like this is, um, it's cleaning up well enough that uh, I think I'm on that kind of trajectory. I thought I thought I was going there the, this time around, but I had a, for some reason, I, I like must have reinfected myself with something and, uh, you know, picked up a, a, like a sweater or something that I'd worn before. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of, kind of flared back up a little bit. So, been drying it out with with hydrogen peroxide and uh, applying a liniment and it seems to be working so like I said I think all told if I continue on the same trajectory I've been on I think by uh, by next week I'd be on the mat 
again. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back, throw into some music because we have not done any yet. And as far as our first dance is concerned, you know we're going to go with Body Count. But which song? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to play that one. It's funny because the the station picked or the the app that I'm using picked a song by Body Count right off the bat. But that's not the one I want to go with. Here we go. Ace of Spades, First Dance, here on Coin Metal. And that was Infectious Grooves with Stop Funkin' With My Head. <sighs> a little a little high on the volume there, gotta tone it down. It's fucking... Dude, every once in a while... I, I do what I can to to make sure that the the music is just like ambiance, you know, that like I don't do real long pauses or anything like that in my my speaking because you know I don't want people to be reefing the songs off of my shows and then like copying them and selling them and all that other bullshit. I mean, really. I don't see anything wrong with doing that. <laughs> I mean, but that's just me, you know. It's like. I, I come from the era where Metallica was bootlegging their own fucking concerts, hiring people and having them out in the audience saying, hey, yo, give you a free fucking show, man. Just keep this, this recorder on you and record the tape and give me the tape and everything will be cool. And then they would reproduce the tape and sell it at the next concert as a, as a quote-unquote bootleg and that was the distribution method back then. Because, you know, back then they didn't have a, a major record label fucking contract or anything like that. And so, you know, it's like I look at that and I, I think to myself, you know, that's that's using the medium of piracy to a positive capital end. You know, and it's like I'm looking at it in terms of like, the only thing this is really costing anybody is, I bought the fucking CD to begin with. I don't I don't play anything on the show that I don't have a physical copy of. So, you know, there's that. And, of course, the time. The time that it's on the show. That's a cost. You know, because that time could be occupied by something else, too. You know? But I gladly give both, because I enjoy doing this. Anyway, as far as what we're going to get into today, um, I, don't, I, don't, I got somebody messaging me about like some sort of shit that they want to involve me or somebody else in. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I sometimes I, I wonder why I'm kind of antisocial. And I, I think I figured it out. Is that since about 2013, 2014... Um, in my social sphere, it's become possible, or at least it's become common, for people to lose their money, specifically because people track them down and, you know, hack their shit and whatever. But the the point being that, you know, that's a, uh, that's kind of like an ever-present threat, you know, and so you got to watch who you're, who you're talking to online, what projects you're affiliating with, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, it's like, and, and I, I looked it up, and I don't know if it was from from jiu-jitsu or, or from dealing in crypto, but I was reading through the symptoms of, of like, people who've, who've been through massive trauma, and I'm like, I'm fitting all of them. You know, it's like, <laughs> apologizes profusely, so, so it's like, uh, according to them, I've been through, like, PTSD and shit, you know, or I've been through some major trauma. Well, like I said, I don't know whether to attribute it to cryptocurrencies or, or jiu-jitsu or, or what, but maybe. I don't know. Anyway, I noticed this thing, and, and we're not necessarily going with something new, but I, I I caught on to it, and it just it seemed kind of interesting because I, I don't think I've actually covered it in any kind of depth. And it's interesting to me because of what's going on with Ethereum and their desire to go to proof of stake or at least the stated desire of the Ethereum Foundation or 
the people trying to run that ship. Now, personally, I put the health of your network above everything else. And so when you're examining the options available to you, you have to evaluate all of them with an equal eye, not just favoring the ones that happen to align with a projected destination that you may have. You know, so like the Ethereum Foundation, I believe they've got some special design for how Ethereum is supposed to be used and what they want it used for. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay. That's what they want. What they want and what the market wants are not necessarily the same thing, though. And this is this is why all of this shit works on on the basis of consensus is the idea that you're you're having to agree with people that you don't even know. They're just they're node providers out there in the rest of the world somewhere. You have no idea where they live. Well, to some extent, you can monitor where, or find out where they live, but you, you don't really care. Do they provide accurate work? That's what's ma that 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 is the thing that matters. And so, when you're talking about changing from a proof of work network to a proof of stake network, you're also reducing the cost profile, or at least proposing to reduce the cost profile of attacking such a network. Because, you know, ASIC machines are kind of expensive and, and running th tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of them in the pursuit of that ever lovely coin is a hell of an endeavor. Anyway, got this thing here. It's on Coindesk.com. Ethermine adds front running software to help miners offset EIP 1559 revenue losses. Hmm. And I, I think I wanted to look up, I think I did look up what EIP 1559 is, and maybe on the other side of the music break, we'll look into what that loss was, but we'll see how far this takes us. Anyway, this is by William Foxley, and was authored on March 17th, 2021, at 2.26 p.m. PDT. So, today... <clears throat> Ethereum mining pool Ethermine introduced new software that could mollify miners upset by a coming steep cut in mining fees by allowing them to eke out greater profit from each block mined. The Austria-based pool, which comprises some 20% of the Ethereum network's hash power, became the first majority pool to introduce a quote, maximal extracted value MEV software strategy in order to compensate the quote upcoming mining reward reduction caused by the adoption of EIP 1559 according to a tweet Wednesday MEV automates transaction sequencing in blockchains based on possible arbitrage opportunities which Ethermine expects to increase mining rewards between 1 to 10% Ethermine plans to distribute 80% of MEV's profits to the pool. That EIP is slated for inclusion in the Ethereum network in July with the London hard fork. The proposal burns network transaction fees instead of giving them to miners who process transactions. Miners are not very pleased with the proposal, even going so far as to threaten a 51% attack against Ethereum, but have few options on the table given Ethereum's governance structure. <clears throat> so, most mining pools are adding MEV to supplement the lost income. In Ethereum, MEV is a general term relating to numerous strategies for front-running or back-running transactions in order to secure an arbitrage profit. The strategy has garnered wide attention in the trading community over the past year as decentralized finance protocols rose in popularity. Indeed, 
MEV data tracker Flashbots shows some $5 million in MEV-based profits were made in the last 24 hours alone. Developers and miners alike have begun turning to MEV as a way to supplement miners who are certain to face steep revenue declines with fee burns. If either mine did not return questions for comment by press time, you know what's going to end up happening is they're going to tweak it to where they're getting 11% pretty much consistently, and that'll just be an additional premium on fees and drive up fees even more. So you really got to wonder what the uh, what the actual intended effect is, because this is kind of like chess only in multiple dimensions, not just not just three, and not just four, <laughs> but multiple dimensions. You know, where you're having to consider your, your gas fees for your projected gas fees, you know, not, not just current gas fees. You know, you gotta be looking at it going, okay, if Ethereum is $2,000, how much approximately go, am I gonna have to pay for Ethereum or pay in terms of gas in order to facilitate my transactions. And, and the thing is, is this doesn't stop with just booting out all the little, the little newbies and all the little retail end traders, which it's intended to do, by the way. It's intended to put such a premium on the block space for Ethereum's network, then the average person does not have that permissionless on-ramp that they had before. And so now they'll end up having to go through Visa or MasterCard or somebody else in order to facilitate that on-chain transaction that will, you know, enable whatever it is that they want to do. And so again, the I think that this this continuous push with regard to the Ethereum Foundation in in trying to direct Ethereum in a certain direction, you know, getting away from proof of work. Fuck you. Why, why do you want to get away from proof of work? The the idea that it's quote unquote energy inefficient, it's 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 wasteful, it's a bunch of bullshit. The fact of the matter is is that hardware goes through several iterations of use. You know, whether we're talking about ASICs or graphics cards or whatever, that stuff ends up getting resold. You know, the, the big high-end miner, he'll get his 6 to 12 months out of that hardware, and then he'll roll it over for the newest shit. Well, when it goes back out to the market, some of it will go to gamers. A lot of it's going to go to miners. They'll buy it at a discount, even though it's not necessarily producing 100%. You know, they, they've figured a way to tweak it to, to make it profitable for them to buy deprecated hardware and use it. And I mean, there, there's people using stuff back six generations right now with Bitcoin going up to $60,000 a fucking coin. I mean, suddenly it becomes worth it to even though you're not getting prime yield on those miners to rehabilitate them and fucking set it to but like this idea that um, <clears throat> that the miners are going to eliminate their ability to to be paid for their services in the in terms of miner fees that they're somehow going to be able to encourage the miners to flatten their fees. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. But I'm, I'm assuming that's what, what EIP-1559 is. Let's see here. Yeah, this is authored today. Anyway, let's go for it. This is on Coindesk as well. Valid points. Ethereum's proof of stake may happen sooner than you think. Yeah, whatever. And this is by William Foxley and Christine Kim. So yes, penis and no. No penis. And uh, this is authored on March 17th, 2021 at 4.30 a.m. PDT. 
Ethereum 2.0 may be coming to a computer screen near you quicker than most anticipated, including the Ethereum developers. Last week, Vitalik Buterin released a quote, quick merge via fork choice change document, a lighter version of the executable beacon chain for quick, for quick deployment. While only a loose technical document, the plan ostensibly serves as a notice against any further agitation from Ethereum miners as the merge would allow Ethereum to abandon mining in a rapid fashion. The executable beacon chain is a proposal to attach Ethereum 1.x, or 1.x, which we will now refer to as ETHPOW, Proof of Work Ethereum, onto the currently running Proof of Stake Ethereum, the beacon chain. The proposal works by having slightly altered Ethereum software like Geth or Open Ethereum point its transaction flow at the beacon chain instead of miners packaging transactions into blocks. The beacon chain's validators will verify and finalize transactions. Quote, the only change required to the ETHPOW side is that the client must have a communication channel with a trusted beacon node, to a trusted beacon node and must change its fork choice rule, Buterin writes. Why the rush? A quick in transition schedule has been considered for a few reasons. One recent consideration has been rising tensions between mining parties and Ethereum developers as EIP-1559 and POS come into focus. The former proposal is highly contested by mining parties, but it has achieved enough support amongst developers to be included in, Ju in July's London hard fork. POS, of course, would see mining done away with completely. Developers, however, have the high ground in this fight. A quick merge to POS would only require, quote, at least one honest miner, no, 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 one compliant miner, in order to start the merge. Multiple honest mining parties pointing blocks to the beacon chain would entail a smooth transition, Buterin says. A quick transition to POS does preclude the inclusion of multiple highly touted Ethereum tech stacks, at least for the moment. Uh, James Press, which is a tweet, um, in the last 18 months since this joke, ETH2 roadmap cut shards from 1024 to 64, ETH2 roadmap cut EEs, ETH2 roadmap cut shard execution, ETH2 team launched a network without transactions, Bitcoin continued to exist and process transactions. <laughs> Yet at the end of the day, a transition to POS remains the goal of Ethereum developers, developers, as it has been since before ETHPAL launched. A transition to POS where Ethereum doesn't lose its top dog position as the go-to platform for decentralized apps would likely be considered a victory. If you're new to valid points in the topic of Ethereum 2.0 in general, be sure to check out our blah 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 1021 explainer metrics to get up to speed on terminology used throughout this newsletter. Blah blah blah. <clears throat> Coindesk's ETH 2.0 validator node Zelda is humming along perfectly, earning roughly 0.0073 Ethereum or 3.63% or $13.12 per day. And that's at existing prices though. While the amount of reward earned by our ETH2 validator has not changed significantly over the past few weeks, I did notice a spike in Zelda's computer processing power and a subsequent drop in her memory usage. According to Coindesk's data dashboard, Zelda's central, pro central processing unit, CPU usage, almost doubled from around 100% to 200% on Friday, March 12th, and has stayed at those heightened levels ever since. This suggests that Zelda is consuming more electrical energy in order to perform the same tasks it did before. For context, 
Zelda has four CPUs it can max out before validator options are negatively impacted. Operating at a level of 200% suggests that we're using the max computing power out of two out of the out of two, I'm sorry, of two out of four CPUs. At the same time, Zelda's us usage of random access memory, which is the component of a computer that is reserved for temporary data storage, has gone down from around 4 gigabytes to roughly 2.5 gigabytes. This suggests that the memory capacity needed for running this Ethereum 2.0 validator has dropped. Zelda has up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, enough for an average desktop computer to run various applications and demanding games. For Ethereum 2.0 validating, we, we use roughly 15% of total RAM, enough for a tablet device to use. Ethereum Validator Rewards versus Mining Rewards It's important to note that under a proof-of-work consensus protocol, whereby transactions and blocks are finalized through the process of mining, the aim would be to consistently max out a computer's processing power and optimize all unused components of hardware for increasing the probability of earning network rewards, or block rewards, rather. Under Ethereum's proof-of-stake consensus protocol, there's no need to do either of these things. Despite operating below its computational capacity, Zelda still maintains an effectiveness of 100% according to beaconchain.in or beaconcha.in. This is because, unlike mining, staking isn't about competing for rewards against other validators through greater hash power. All validators who keep their operations up and running are rewarded on a consistent and regular basis in the form of interest on their stake. The only way to substantially increase the amount of rewards earned on the network is to stake more wealth in 32 Ethereum increments. More on the, on the reward dynamics of Ethereum 2.0 validators versus Ethereum miners here. Yeah, okay, whatever. The Ethereum 2.0 network does not reward aggressive increases in computing power nor sneaky optimizations to hardware. If anything, developers of the protocol are working hard to find ways in which the computational burden of being a validator can be reduced even further and updated so that even a mobile device could one day be sufficient for securing the network. Going back to the mysterious changes in CPU usage and RAM, it turns out a code update was released by Coin Coindesk Director of Engineering Spencer Beggs last Friday in preparation for Ethereum's upcoming system-wide upgrade dubbed Berlin. As an Ethereum 2.0 validator, Zelda's responsibilities can only be performed by connecting to both Ethereum's proof-of-work and proof-of-stake networks. The upcoming upgrade to Ethereum's proof-of-work network required Begs to update part of our software, which likely triggered those changes in our energy consumption and memory usage. This code update is mandatory for all Ethereum 2.0 validators and must be implemented by April 14, 2021 at the latest. If you're a validator and haven't yet made the upgrade, you can download and install the latest software releases for Berlin here. And I'm sure that goes to their, their version of it or whatever. <clears throat> and so, yeah. And, uh gives us other stuff on it. Anyway, so uh, I think this is kind of interesting in that they're they're taking it serious enough to write articles about it, but the fact of the matter is, is they keep running into this wall. And it's a reality that at one point or another they're going to have to face. If the Ethereum miners dump it, if if it does stop being a proof of work network, then it's not worth $1,840 anymore. It's worth like 15 bucks. And if that happens, 
Are they even going to be able to get enough people bothering to try and stake it? I would imagine that a lot of people would try and liquidate their 32, 32 Ethereum stake if, if Ethereum were to tank from like $1,800 and 18, or yeah, $1,840. If it were to tank from there down to $184. How many of those people that are currently staking 32 Ethereum are going to fucking stick around? I guarantee you, not very many of them. Even people that said, oh yeah, we're, we're definitely going to stay on. You know, they, they're looking at it when it was, you know, going to a thousand and thinking, oh yeah, it's wonderful. You know, they were, they were paying 800 and something at the time for it, but hey, it, it looked like it was worth it. It looked like it was going to appreciate or maybe it wasn't even that much. Maybe it was like 400 Either way, I would imagine that they would want to be liquidating that stake rather than letting it sit around in a fucking wallet or, or tied up in a smart contract uh, wait, waiting for this fucking bullshit to happen. But yeah, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think if it does happen, what, what will have to happen beforehand is that they'll have to get the miners to put through an EIP that lowers the threshold for con for alterations in Ethereum's consensus to like a 75% or something like that, right? And then they'll collaborate with whatever miners they can get to collaborate with them and spin up a whole bunch of AWS instances and use that to try and leverage it use that to try and push it over because basically they did the same thing with the UASF on Bitcoin's network where they they just spun up a whole bunch of a AWS instances and, and called it the user activated soft fork when in fact there were relatively few organic users who were actually involved in that shit anyway let's go ahead and throw back down with some music because yeah I don't, I don't think that's going to I don't think that's going to work out. But where to go? I think this one will work. Cowboys from Hell. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Suicidal Tendencies with Hearing Voices. And so... Yeah. <clears throat> Continuing on. What well, we were... Uh, talking about before the the uh, music break there I did a little bit of digging around and I found this thing and uh, this is on ETH Research or ETHRESER.CH MEV auction auctioning transaction ordering rights as a solution to minor extractable value and uh, this one was authored on uh, January 2020 and uh, actually, you know what? I want to go into this one, but I also found this. And uh, this one was something we wanted to cover beforehand, I think. Maybe. Possibly. I don't know if I've actually covered this one yet. I don't think I, don't think I have. Anyway, this one's on Coindesk. And this is actually the reason why miners are wanting to go to this MEV bullshit. Ethereum's EIP-1559 fee market overhaul greenlit for July. And uh, this one was authored by William Foxley. And uh, this is authored March 5th, 2021 at 12.18 p.m. PST. One of the most significant and contentious alterations to the Ethereum blockchain in recent memory is now scheduled for inclusion into its code base. The Ethereum, the Ethereum Improvement Pro Proposal 1559 will be packaged with the London Hard Fork this coming July, regardless of the mining industry's discontent with the proposal, according to the All Core Members Call Friday. <clears throat> Let me check something really quick. I'm going to find out if that's text. No. It's not. Okay. I, I was hoping it was going to be text. That way I could just read it. Anyway, continuing. 
Ethereum improvement proposal 1559 will be packaged. Blah, blah, blah. We got that all. all right. 1559 in London. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. All core developers call Friday. At least five other EIPs are likely to join EIP 1559 in London. EIP 1559 flips a typical blockchain transaction on its head in order to fix numerous issues with Ethereum's user experience. Traditionally, a user sends a gas fee to a miner for a transaction to be included in a block. That fee will now be sent to the network itself as a sort of burn called base fee with only an optional tip to be paid to miners. <clears throat> the burn fee is algorithmically set as well, ostensibly making it easier for users to pay a fair fee. The proposal has garnered some of the largest support to date from Ethereum application creators and users alike, given the current difficulty of selecting a correct transaction fee. Miners and mining pools, on the other hand, have been gathering in opposition against the proposal as it progressed towards mainnet. Mining Gold Rush Indeed, Ethereum mining has been particularly a particularly lucrative business of late. Total mining revenue surpa surpassed a world uh, I'm sorry, a record of 1.3 billion dollars in February, with some 50% of that coming from fees alone, according to CoinMetrics. An increase in both the price of ether and transaction fees was introduced has introduced a wave of new hash power to the network which is more than double that of a year ago minority mining pool flex pool launched a marketing campaign against the EIP <clears throat> several minority pools joined followed by majority pools ethermine and spark pool over 60% of Ethereum network's hash power is now against the proposal. F2 pool is the largest pool in favor of the EIP with some 10% hash power. On the call, Ethereum developers decided to pair EIP 1559 with a delay to the difficulty bomb, also called the Ice Age, the bomb incrementally increases the difficulty of mining on the Ethereum network. Geth team, <coughs> Geth team Peter, Geth team lead Peter Shuzagi uh, <laughs> said that pairing EIP fifteen fifty nine with the delay helped ensure no one would fork Ethereum at that time without having to undergo some technical hurdles. MEV to the rescue Mining pools have only a few options to stop EIP-1559 now that it's included and most of these would be considered actively hostile against the network. The largest danger would be a 51% attack against Ethereum, which would censor transactions using the EIP's framework. It remains unlikely, however, given various financial incentives, not to attack the network. For example, successfully using a 51% attack against Ethereum would likely decrease the value of Ethereum in the short term, or maybe not, as Three fifty-one percent attacks on fifty uh, on Ethereum Classic have shown. Moreover, a new revenue replacement is quickly becoming available for mining networks, called Miner Extracted Value. Miners can take advantage of their place as arbiters on how blocks are packaged to quote front run profitable trades. MEV is currently popular among decentralized finance traders who bid up gas prices to secure their place in the block. Many Ethereum mining pools are currently implementing MEV software to gather this untapped source of revenue. Oh, pardon me. Wow. Yeah, so that's uh <laughs> that's what you can expect. You know, rather than 
this this working for you. This is going to further incentivize miners to cheat. Well, not really cheat per se, but work around the developers. You know, and this has always been an issue for Ethereum. It, they've they've tried to migrate to proof of stake this entire time. See, the fact of the matter is, and something that that Vitalik won't even concede to, is that if they had attempted to launch Ethereum as a proof of stake coin, it would have died in 2017. It wouldn't have seen the ICO boom. It would have just died, along with all the other POS coins out there. And then, a proof of work coin would be doing all of the neat stuff that Ethereum is doing today. It just it it boggles my mind that they think they can like bait and switch an entire network. Oh, you were getting proof of work security, but now it's down to the consensus of the stakeholders, i.e., the rich people. If the rich people decide they don't want to include your transaction in the block, you're going to have to wait until they decide they want to include it in a block. And if you want to innovate, if you want to do something that they don't want to do on the network, <laughs> yeah, forget about it. They'll just leverage their their liquidity over your head, and that'll be that'll be that. You're not going to get anything in there. So yeah, I I think it's hilarious that they even tout proof of stake as some sort of improvement over what they already have. I mean, you read it. We read it right here in this article here that their network has basically doubled over the last last year okay this entire time they've been talking about oh we're going to make it a proof of stake network we're going to make it a proof of stake network we're going to make ethereum into proof of stake they've been saying that shit this entire fucking time and rather than people investing in proof of stake validators they're investing in proof of work miners. So what does that tell you? It tells me that they want to mine. They want to mine Ethereum. Now, if you want to do something about gas fees and all that business, it's really simple. Remove the gas limit on the blocks. Allow as many transactions as happen over the the 30 second or whatever your block interval is. I think it's like it's either 30 seconds or two minutes or one of the two. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't remember. Anyway, <clears throat> point being that, you know, whatever the the uh, transaction load is for that block, th that's what gets, gets rewarded. If it's a one megabyte block, cool. If it's a two megabyte block, big whoop-de-doo. If it's an 18 megabyte block, who gives a shit? They're all legitimate transactions. They they all had fees associated with them. But you think about what that would do to the average fee price. See, without the constraint of the block size limit, you're not competing for a set volume of block space in which to stuff your transaction. You're just trying to get it in to this block. And you don't really give a fuck if it gets in the next block or the one after that or the one after that or the one after that. Because the confirm time for the block, that's the confirm time for the network. Anyway. <clears throat> and this, this is my point of contention with Bitcoin. And it's one of the reasons why Bitcoin has as much competition from within the crypto space as it does. Because many people, probably the vast majority of people, are actually opposed to using Bitcoin as a swift style network when in fact the direct access to that network was promised to them and is promised to the miners once the miners can no longer afford to use it because the transaction fees themselves have become too expensive you can rest assured that they will go on to support other networks and that would result in network loss of hashing power and it would make the coin less secure. 
So yeah, there's there's trade offs. You know, the the fucking core team for Bitcoin they like to tra- talk about trade offs, but they they never mention these trade offs. What losses in security the Bitcoin network could see? It just it doesn't fucking register. They, they don't think people are watching the amount of hash rate that's being dedicated to the coin. And the fact of the matter is is the miners are very concerned with how much hashing power is on the coin because they're competing against it. You know? Anyway. <clears throat> I got a few other things I wanted to get into here. And so this one, this is kind of older, but it's uh, it's kind of a counter on a counter on a counter where the miners are wanting to do this MEV business in order to get around the developers trying to terminate their access to transaction fees in attempts to get them to charge less for doing the job that they do while doing the same amount of work if not more you got this thing here it's on medium.com flashbots front running the MEV crisis Flashbots is a research and development organization formed to mitigate the negative externalities and existential risks posed by minor extractable value to smart contract blockchains. We propose a permissionless, transparent, and fair ecosystem for MEV extraction to reinforce the Ethereum ideals. And this is by Alex Obadia, I guess? Anyway, continue. What is MEV? Minor extractable value is a measure devised to study consensus security by modeling the profit a miner or validator, sequencer, or other privileged protocol actor can make through their ability to arbitrarily include, exclude, or reorder transactions from the blocks they produce. MEV includes both, quote, conventional profits from transaction fees and block rewards and unconventional profits from transaction reordering, transaction insertion, and transaction censorship within the block a miner is producing. The term MEV can be misleading as one would assume it is miners who are extracting this value. In reality, the MEV present on Ethereum today is predominantly captured by DeFi traders through structural arbitrage, trading strategies, miners indirectly profit from from these traders' transaction fees. One example of such structural arbitrage opportunities are Uniswap price arbitrage trades, when a Uniswap pool's assets become mispriced, a profit opportunity is created to arbitrage the Uniswap pool back to parity with other trading venues. Of course, rather than letting the trader pay them a, trans- a transaction fee for the privilege of collecting the arbitrage profit, a miner could simply decide to run this strategy themselves. The MEV Crisis Transactors on Ethereum express their willingness to pay for inclusion in a block through their transaction's gas price, and therefore through the the transaction fee they indicate they are willing to pay to miners. Miners, as economically rational actors, pick the transactions with the highest gas price and order them by gas spend in the block they are producing. The financial system being built on Ethereum creates many pure profit opportunities such as liquidations and arbitrages of many kinds. However, these opportunities are finite and episodic and, as such, traders compete to claim them. Right now, this competition is primarily expressed either via front-running or via back-running. Front-running, also known as Priority Gas Auctions, PGAs, Transaction A is broadcast with a higher, a higher gas price than an already pending Transaction B, so that A gets mined before B. 
ergo to snatch a Uniswap price arbitrage trade to rebalance a pool. Back running. <clears throat> Transaction A is broadcast with a slightly lower gas price than already pen pending transaction B, so that A gets mined right after B in the same block. Ergo, to execute a, a DYDX liquidation after a price oracle update that triggers a D DYDX loan to go under the required collateralization ratio. Unfortunately, both front running and back running are inefficient and lead to negative externalities such as network congestion, i.e. peer-to-peer network load and chain congestion, i.e. block space usage. In addition, this competition for MEV opportunities leads to Ethereum consensus security instability due to the creation of incentives for time bandit attacks and permission communication infrastructure between traders and miners. Such an infrastructure er erodes the neutrality, transparency, decentralization, and permissionlessness of Ethereum today. While none of these existential risks and negative externalities are new, we find ourselves at a critical junction between altern alternative future futures for Ethereum. A series of events in the past six months have led, led usage of the network to reach a tipping point. 1. Steadily increasing contract interactions, i.e. there are more complex transactions on Ethereum than before, which increases the absolute amount of MEV up for grabs. Token market cap exceeding Ethereum market cap, i.e. MEV revenue in ERC-20 tokens is starting to compete with regular transaction fees paid in Ethereum. Transaction fees exceeding block rewards, i.e. transaction fees have reached unprecedented levels partially due to, partly due to traders pushing the gas prices up when competing for trading opportunities. It is a clue that MEV-related revenue may surpass block reward for miners. Adoption of generalized frontrunners, i.e. an indicator of increased sophistication in MEV extraction. Adoption of permissioned mempools, i.e. another indicator of such sophistication. These events include, indicate an accelerating trend towards the foretold existential risks and negative externalities. Front running the MEV crisis. Enter Flashbots. <clears throat> Flashbots is a research and development organization formed to mitigate the negative externalities and existential risks posed by MEV to smart contract blockchains. We propose a permissionless, transparent, and fair ecosystem for MEV extraction to preserve the ideals of Ethereum. Our approach to mitigating the MEV crisis can be broken down into three parts. Illuminate, <coughs> illuminate the dark forest, democratize e extraction, and distribute benefits. We believe each part is necessary for flashbots to succeed. Illuminate the dark for forest. MEV is currently opaque to users of Ethereum. It requires significant data analysis and in-depth knowledge of smart contracts to understand as it involves transactions with complex, sometimes obfuscated logic and adversarial games played on several meta levels users, traders, generalized frontrunners, and miners. <clears throat> as more and more security critical infrastructure moves off chain, and as chain state and size grows, this problem will only get worse, and it will become increasingly difficult to leverage one of the original promises of cryptocurrency. Transparency. 
by illuminating the dark forest, we aim to preserve this original promise. More practically, we aim to allow for the objective assessment of negative externalities of the MEV crisis and the impact of flashbot technologies and for the quantification of user harm caused by MEV extraction in order to provide tooling for builders to reduce their DAP surface for MEV extraction. <clears throat> Our first step to eliminate the dark, uh, illuminate the dark forest is quantifying its impact. We've built MEV Inspect for this purpose. It scans the Ethereum blocks and enables visualization of MEV metrics over time. We use it to better understand the MEV ecosystem and provide it to the community in, attempt, in an attempt to annihilate information asymmetry. Democratized extraction. MEV extraction could likely go in a direction where it is centralized to a few players. For instance, being limited to permissioned dark transaction pools that have access to significant hash rate or through unilateral off chain deals between large traders and miners. This power and capital centralization is a key point of security weakness and erodes core principles of Ethereum, namely permissionlessness and decentralization. We believe that without the adoption of neutral, public, open source infrastructure for permissionless MEV extraction, MEV risks become <coughs> becoming an insider's game. By democratizing MEV extraction, we aim to ensure both small and large participants have equal access to low-level financial primitives and that core Ethereum properties are preserved. MEV-Geth is our initial effort to de democratize extraction. It is an upgrade to the Goeth Go-Ethereum client to enable a sealed bid block space auction mechanism for communicating transaction order preference. Fundamentally, MEV-Geth get, get, creates a more efficient communication channel for miners and traders hiding or bidding for inclusion of their transactions. While the proof of concept of MEV-Geth MEV has incomplete trust guarantees, we believe it is a significant improvement over the status quo. The adoption of MEV Geth should relieve a lot of the network chain congestion caused by front-running and back-running bots. Distribute Benefits MEV involves the entire eth Ethereum ecosystem, from miners, traders, DeFi developers, and most importantly, Ethereum users. Our preliminary research shows MEV extraction currently disproportionately benefits traders and miners. As MEV extraction continues to grow and scale, we anticipate there will be a need for some value redistribution towards users and towards system stability. We believe it is essential for Flashbots and the community working alongside us to be thoughtful and deliberate about value redistribution in order to maximize social good. This is particularly true given the aforementioned dangerous economic incentives inherent to MEV, which cause existential risks. Not only do we want to mitigate such risks, but also believe it is our responsibility to replace them with virtuous economic cycles that will reinforce Ethereum's core value proposal by aligning incentives around MEV for all system participants. Our public commitments. Flashbots arose from the MEV pi dash rates ship, a neutral chain agnostic interdisciplinary research collective 
that supports MEV-related theoretical and empirical research. As an open research, or research organization, we commit today and in the future to 1. Preserve the core values of Ethereum in what we create, i.e. openness, permissionlessness, decentralization against the coming MEV crisis. Making our research and core Flashbots infrastructure code open source for any community member to contribute to and benefit from. Creating sustainable alignment across key sectors of the ecosystem by taking into account the needs of users, miners, developers, node operators, public infrastructure operators, and developers, contract slash dap devs, and ecosystem researchers. Con contributing to open-ended ethical research questions in the MEV space, 100% in the public domain. It is our deeply held belief, as both an organization and as the individuals involved, that decentralized finance is at a critical crossroads. The substantial amount of value on the table from manipulating user transactions could serve as a centralizing force. Damaging to consensus stability and harmful to users of any system where such manipulation is valuable. MEV could grow to benefit a few at the expense of many, at the expense of the value of cryptocurrency itself. Or this value could stand to benefit all users, enhancing the security of a new generation of financial infrastructure that avoids the mistakes of its structurally unfair predecessors. By bringing MEV extraction and tooling into the open, by funding public research to answer open questions around MEV, and by using our organizational capital to align the incentives of all ecosystem participants, it is this new generation of fair infrastructure we aim to lay the foundations for. This is a call to action. We can't wait to have you join us. Yeah, um, interesting. Let me see if the response is on this. Three responses. Um, Paul Arsov says, did you modify Geth according to your proposal, or are you just writing about your ideas? Um, Alex Obadia says, yes, check out our ETH research post on the topic. Gives a nice link. And our GitHub, where the, the code is open source. Paul upon this was approximately three months ago. Let's see here. Um, code investigating cases. What are some examples of this? I'm trying to get an idea of what you meant by security critical infrastructure moving off chain. And there is a reply to that. Um, Alex says basically, Kiber bots are a good example. When they fail because of ergo increased congestion, the system breaks, and you see weird maker liquidations. This happens a lot. So, the PGA code is security critical for maker, but is not on chain. Hmm. Let's see, Chris Lee says, great article. Out of curiosity, why transactions in the mining pools are transparent in the first place? Is it due to historical reason, or making them opaque comes with serious drawbacks? Hmm. I don't know, and I couldn't tell you. But yeah, so I think this is more attempts at, at pushing the the use of Ethereum by just the developers. And I don't think you can really do that. You know, I mean I think you can you can provide code for certain implementations and whatever, but you can't really put a gun to people's heads and expect that without any question, they're simply going to adopt your code. In the case of some users, we could be talking about billions and billions of dollars in Ethereum 
that you're asking them to just say, hey, you know, uh, trust us. Everything will be fine. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's not fun when it's not fine. You know, when something fucks up because of some misalignment. You know, so somebody didn't talk to somebody else and because of that, certain certain adjustments weren't made, and so something bad happens, and your funds are temporar- temporarily, at least, invisible. I mean, this has happened before. I've seen it happen multiple times with different coins. You know, I mean, it's kind of sad when it does, but it's it's a positive lef- lesson overall, I think, in the level of responsibility that you're actually taking on by participating in this space. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. As far as where to go, I hadn't picked anything out. Of course not. Just don't do it. But I'm having to think up something on the fly. Here we go. Within the Runes, New Holy War, here on Coin Metal. And that was Tool with Schism. And it is with that that I'd like to uh, bring an end to this episode. Uh, But we will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. And as far as our last dance is concerned, I was going to play Master of Puppets, but that thing is like way too long. So we're going to settle for Damage Incorporated Last Dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and y'all have an excellent evening. Good night.